Imagine this small basement laboratory where Philo Farnsworth works alone. His young son stands outside the door and watches as his father throttles up the impossible, man-made, thermonuclear star in a jar. Together, father and son watch the vibrant, shimmering light. And when he is satisfied that he has seen what he needs to see, the father shuts off the machine and begins to dismantle it removes a critical piece, hides it somewhere nobody will ever find it, and takes the secret to his grave. While his contemporaries were making a bomb out of E equals MC squared, Philo Farnsworth applied everything he had learned in decades of perfecting television toward using Einstein's formula to create a clean, safe, and virtually inexhaustible source of industrial energy from controlled nuclear fusion, a quest that seemingly eludes modern science to this day. So, yes, that story is an oversimplification but not, I eventually learned, without some foundation in actual facts. One of the great privileges of my life is the friendship that I enjoyed between 1975 and 1987 with Philo T. Farnsworth III. Over the course of the time that this Philo and I spent together, he taught me the real meaning of invention. And he told me... <laughs> ah, some of you can see the bottom of the third... <laughs> He told me that the story that I had heard on that hillside was apocryphal at best, but he also told me the detail that underscores the essence of that story. The patents, Philo III told me, are incomplete. A patent should serve as an instruction manual, written in such a way that anybody knowledgeable in the art should be able to build the, dis the device disclosed therein. But if something is deliberately left out of the patent, then the device will not work as intended. Something critical was left out of this patent. Now we're left to wonder, did Farnsworth crack the riddle of controlled nuclear fusion, or did the riddle crack him? Remember, he died just three years after this patent was issued at the age of 64. So no, it's not exactly Mr. Fusion. But that was from some time in a fictional future. And this is from 60 years in the actual past. According to one of Farnsworth's colleagues that I spoke with, a model similar to this was capable of producing over a trillion fusion reactions per second. Not quite break even, he said, but we were very close. Four years ago, several people with a strong interest in the Farnsworth approach to fusion gathered in the Los Angeles home of Phil Savinick. That's Phil on the right here. Where the Farnsworth family archives are stored, and we hope at this point just temporarily. There we found all of Farnsworth's lab notes and several early models of the fuser, including the remains of this very first prototype. But what surprised us the most? was a journal none of us had ever seen before, which must have been buried somewhere in a box for over 50 years. The journal was labeled simply notes. And when we opened the bound journal, we were surprised to find that six or seven pages had been torn out. And you don't do that with bound laboratory journals. You don't tear pages out. All that was left was one page that had any writing on it and all it said in Pem Farnsworth's own hand. The ideas, his last ideas, he considered too confidential to leave a record of. He felt the world of humanity was not ready for his last gift and maybe not worthy of it. I believe the Farnsworth Fuser foretells the first element of that last scene in Back to the Future pulled from the actual past and projected into the fictional future. So what about the other element of that last scene, the 
time machine driven by a flux capacitor. Okay, this is a little more of a stretch, so bear with me. Remember what Dr. Byfield said when Townsend Brown asked him what instrument might demonstrate the link between electricity and gravity? A capacitor. Ah. With that in mind, we'll take a closer look at Einstein's theory of general relativity. In general relativity, Einstein unified the three dimensions of space with the fourth dimension of time and redefined the fabric of the cosmos as the space-time continuum. And what we know as gravity, Einstein told us, is a curvature in space-time caused by the presence of massive objects like planets and stars. So if space and time are the unified fabric of the cosmos, and gravity is induced by a curvature of space, doesn't that curvature of space also infer the curvature of time? And if, as Brown and Byfeld surmised, you can create an artificial gravitational field with a highly charged asymmetric capacitor, wouldn't that also imply a temporary localized bending of time? Like I said, I know. It's a bit of a stretch to get from this to this, but I don't think it's an accident that capacitor was the term chosen for this fictional contrivance. I think it's an unwitting prediction based on Townsend Brown's discoveries, just like Mr. Fusion has some basis in the secrets that Philo Farnsworth wrestled with near the end of his life. So the, now the second obvious and unanswered question is, did Townsend Brown find a way to generate synthetic gravity and with that some way of bending both space and time? And if he did, then what became of those discoveries? What did Hal Putoff say? He quieted down because nobody ever got anywhere. Or it quieted down because they did get somewhere and it went black. <laughs>